thank you everybody for coming to this uh, teaching here with Occupy Springfield. Uh, my portion of this presentation is um, Illinois, the only election process in the law. Now I'm talking a very specific portion of Illinois election versus like the whole gamut of Illinois election. I'm not going to be talking about numbers. I'm not going to say why 2 million people and that equals to be 10% of the vote. That's too nerdy for me. I'm talking about the whole technical aspect of the Illinois election process. Um, just to give you a little bit of background who I am, um, I have been involved in politics since the late 90s. Um, I currently serve on the ballot access committee and coronation committee for the Green Party of the United States of America, the National Party. <coughs> Worked on several state and federal campaigns in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa. I testified here in Springfield in 2009 about Illinois election reform regarding primaries. Currently a paralegal with the Green Party. I'm also a consultant. Progressive Consulting is my own business where I work with third party candidates, independent candidates, and not for profit organizations. This list of election law cases are current pending cases just on election law. Whether it be about voter, voter ID, primaries, voter technology, or just about ballots whatsoever. So this is a pretty diverse group from NAACP, Project Vote, the Democratic Party in Texas, or even just individuals up there. So I just want to give you an idea on how often election law cases actually do come up here in the United States. These are people I've, I've talked with, um, with my previous work. Um, there's a book, you can probably get here in the library, um, this one, Illinois Politics, a Citizen's Guide. <coughs> Dr. Um, Kent Redfield, as you can see, he's an interim director at the Institute of Legislative Studies here at UIS. Um, this is what he has to say about that in this very book, that in terms of participation, Illinois is not particular voter friendly. That's just him here, right here in Springfield. The leading law expert, um, Richard Winger, out of California, he's a libertarian. Director of Ballot Access News, this is what he has to say about Illinois specifically, that we're the fourth most severe ballot access requirement in the United States, outside of Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. We are one of the worst states when it comes to being voter friendly. Right here, this is the statute, the actual statute here in Illinois. Um, all this stuff right here, if you want to know more information about what it means about elections, you can just go to this website, um, the Illinois General Assembly website, click on all these articles and understand, if you want to, um, the severity of what we have for election laws. Um, some of these are not reader friendly, some of them are very legal ease, if you will. And some of them were just, you'll just read them and be like, really, our own officials create these laws? Um, it's very, it, for me, it's very interesting. Excuse me, come down here. This website, every, every, if you're running for a campaign, whether it be a consolidated election, which are odd number of years, or running for like state rep, U.S. representatives, or even president or governor, the Illinois State Board of Elections put out this candidate's guide. They put out one every year, and you just go through it, and it will tell you all the requirements necessary on what's coming up, um, age requirements, signature requirements, all that fun stuff, um, which I will get to later on in this presentation. So one of the questions is, is how do you get on the ballot? Well, you circulate a petition, try and gather the signatures you want. Then you notarize that document, file it to the appropriate office that needs to be filed at. You wait until the primary to get on the general election ballot itself here in Illinois. And then you wait to get voted in at the general election. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. All right? And where do you file if you're 
filing at a local level, your county clerk's office, um, your local, you know, the county board, city alderman, mayor, anything from county on down will go to the county clerk's office. If you're talking about state rep, state senator, U.S. Congress, even judicial offices, they all go to Springfield or um, sometimes Chicago, but not always. But it's always here in Chicago, which the office is right here on Spring Street, not too far from here. Um, they do, the State Board of Elections office does have one in Chicago, but this is administrative office, and sometimes they'll direct you there for other, other things. So everything I've said so far really sounds simple, right? You get on the ballot, try to get elected. It's not, it's not that easy. Well, first of all, let's talk about the petition itself. This petition is for independent mayor candidate, Kim Polvin, out of DeKalb. As you can see on his paperwork, you have signatures on there. You have addresses, the county they're in, and the city they're in. That process alone can be tricky. And I'll explain that in a minute. But as you can see, it's signed by him, it's notarized, all that paperwork is good up until that point. So when we're talking about the petitions, let's talk about specifically about state rep and state senate. If you're running for state senator or state rep, say here in Springfield in the 99th district, you need at least 500 to 1500 signatures to run for state rep. If you're a new party, a new party is like Green Party, Libertarian, Socialist, um, all those new parties, or an independent candidate, you need at least 1500 signatures. All of them have to be within the district. Now, if you want to see one for, well, let me back up one bit. I'll talk about a little bit about the established party. If you're running for house here in Springfield, say like in the 13th district, an established party, you need at least 600 signatures in, that congress in the congressional district. If you're a new party or independent party, you need at least 5,000, at least 5,000 signatures to be on the ballot alone. Now, I would like to point out, state rep here in Illinois, you need 500 to 1,500 signatures as an established party. For Congress, you need 600 signatures for a congressional candidate. <clears throat> the top portion is what a state rep district looks like. The bottom is the, the new 13th congressional district. So in the 99th district of state rep, you need 500 signatures. But if you're in the 13th congressional district, which is Springfield, Champaign-Urbana, and it goes all the way down towards Carbondale, you need 600 signatures. To some say, well, that's fine. But really, you're talking about a larger district where you need only 600 signatures, but a small district only needs 500 signatures. If some of you are not worried about that, you should, because that's very concerning to most people, that a big district needs a very small percent of a, of a signature requirement. Now, I talked about established party new party. So what does established party mean? Established party in Illinois, if the gubernatorial candidate of that gubernatorial race, that candidate's that candidate needs 5% or greater to be an established party. So Democrats and Republicans get 5% or greater always. It wasn't until 06 the Green Party became an established party in the state of Illinois, first time since the 30s. That has happened. And Rich Whitney, who ran for, as a governor, got 10% of the general election vote. Now, when, he, when Rich ran this time in 2010, we got 2% of the vote. So our established party status went from we were an established party to not being an established party. So the, it's a whole new ball game now for the Green Party. 
and I can explain more about that a little bit, but I just want to show you what it means to be an established party versus not being an established party under the auspices of the state of Illinois. Now, I talked about petitioning before. You have the signature requirements and everything. Any person can look at that petition, look at it, and say, I object to these signatures. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at Ken's petition one more time, if I was a candidate running for mayor in DeKalb, I can say, well, on line 10, I can't read that signature. I object to that signature. That person on line 4 does not live at that address. I object to that. And this is very legal. Anyone can look at this and take off signature requirements or object to the whole process whatsoever. It's very common, like I said. So you can you can object to anyone's petition, per excuse me, petitions. Like I said, it's most common during the election year. And this can be done at the county clerk's office if you're like running for mayor or county board or state board of elections here in Springfield and review someone's petitions to get them off as a governor candidate, congressional candidate. Anyone can do this. Doesn't be within the party. Um, Chris can go down to Springfield and object to Aaron Schock's petitions if you wanted to. It's very legal. It's very legal, but he needs justification why they need to be objected. So this is what a, I apologize for not seeing this very well, but this is what an objection letter looks like. This one in particular was a 2008 objection um, when a uh, Democratic candidate was trying to get a Green Party candidate off the ballot um, as, a, like I said, a congressional candidate. So this was an official letter that we sent out to the State Board of Elections on why um, you know, why this particular person needs to be thrown off the case, or excuse me, thrown off the um, petition. So we talked about petitioning. We talked about objections. We've talked about um, what it means to be an established party and everything. So what do you do next? Well, you have three different options. One, there's a primary. You can go straight to the general election if you're, no one's running within that party or there's slating. Um, when we talk about these three things, a primary, if, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a method where a candidate can be chosen to be in a particular race. In Illinois, we have what we call a closed primary. So if you're a Republican or, Republican or a Democrat, you can go to the booth on primary elections and say, I want a Republican ballot, I want a Democratic ballot. Um, again, when I said before when the Green Party was an established party in 06. When we got a presidential candidate for 2008, you at that time could go in and say, I want a Green Party ticket or a Green Party ballot. That was the first time we ever had that happen. But since we lost that, we don't have that right anymore. So this coming presidential election, you can't say we want that ballot hit. You have two choices. So in Illinois, like I said, we have a closed primary. An open primary is when a registered voter can choose any party. So a Democrat can go get a Republican ballot if they wanted to and vote for um, a candidate on that ballot. But there's other methods, there's other approaches to getting someone elected. There's caucuses, Some, most of you are familiar with the Iowa caucus. Um, when I was caucus coordinator in 2006, or excuse me, back in 2004, um, all it is is a big meeting, and people come to a room about like this size, and we talk about the candidates at hand. At that time, it was John Kerry, um, Leslie Clark, Al Sharpton, um, I forgot who the other Democratic candidates are, and he came in and said, okay, the people that want to vote for Kerry can be in that corner, people who want Al Sharpton can be in that corner, people who want Leslie Clark can be over here, um, and one of the other candidates are over here, and you talk about you discuss it, and that's where you elect those delegates to go to the national convention. That's pretty much what a caucus is in a nutshell. There's a hybrid of both a primary and a caucus. That's a little bit more complicated because there's things like the Texas two-step where they have a primary one week, and the next week they have a caucus in order to get that person on the ballot. 
Um, West Virginia does a little bit, something similar to it, but a little bit different. And there's a runoff uh, method where you rank a person on the ballot, and if that person gets 50% or more, that will be your candidate for the ongoing election. It will be a general election or whatever the next qualifying election would be. Europe does this model, um, not only Greens, certain universities like Harvard University Student Government uses this. Other city councils in the United States, such as uh, I believe in um, Fairfax County in California uses it as well. So it's a very, it's a very popular method, in my opinion. So why is, oh, excuse me, I just skipped a slide. So what else you should be worried about? Redistricting. Redistricting is very worried, it's a very worried thing because if you're redistricted, the, the, the battle between the Republicans and Democrats this year was certain districts need to be redistricted so one party can have control over the other party, um, which is bad. And again, I'm, and I apologize, I'm going back to the Green Party. This is what I do most of my work in is the Green Party. Right now, in the 13th Congressional District, what we're talking about, we have certain established districts in that congressional district. We claim those, but the Democratic Party says, no, you don't. You lost the entire establishment everywhere. So we have a court case against the Illinois State Board of Elections saying, we're right, you're wrong. It's a big legal battle. Um, the voter ID laws, the Women League of Voters versus Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Um, I just left that when I left Wisconsin. That was the big thing. If voter ID is constitutional at the polls, now in Wisconsin you need voter ID once you go there, but the Le Women League of Voters saying no, that's not constitutional, and we sh you should not have voter IDs. Voter technology, um, Zirkel versus V. Henry is a New Jersey case. Um, they have touch screens in Jersey, and um, Zirkel is fighting the case that it's unconstitutional to have touchscreen because there's no assurance that your vote actually counts. It goes back to the 2000 case of the hanging chad. This is, this is the very same case, but now it's with technology. Um, so that's a, a current pending case at this moment. So why is this important to me? Because voting is very basic. You know, we're taught in middle school, we're taught in high school. This is the age requirement. You need to be a president, everyone else. You need a petition go through the process, and hopefully get elected. Like I said, it's very plain and simple. But there are a lot of legal hoops. There's a lot of statutes involved when it comes to getting even on the ballot. And again, I'm not talking about the outcomes. I'm talking about the very process itself. It's very basic. And if we want to create change, we need to change the current policy in place when, it get, when, it, when it's about getting on the ballot. So why is this particular presentation important to the Occupy movement? I feel we as a movement should talk about ref election reform here in Illinois. I'm not talking about getting people elected. I'm talking about actual policy reform. And I also feel as a movement, we can start building communities and start showing people that we can get people who are not on the ballot into communities that make effective change, whether it be about housing, whether it be about homelessness, whatever it needs to be, election, election reform is important and it's in getting the right people in the right office to change those policies. And right now I will open up to any questions any, any of you might have. And again, I know this is a very boring subject, so I can understand if you were asleep by now. So. <laughs> Anything about the process? Anything about why I feel Illinois is a crappy state when it comes to election law? I'll say it bluntly, it's a very crappy state. Could you elaborate on some of the methods they're using to deny people a vote? Well, like I said, I mean, right now we have a closed primary. So right now in the state of Illinois, you only have two choices, Republican and Democrat. And we have libertarian candidates, constitutional candidates, socialist candidates. They are not even on the ballot. We don't even have those choices. And so those people are being denied of
being on the ballot as well as saying, hey, this person is running, look at me, but you can't because there's only a two-party system. Now, I didn't talk about slating. Slating is if you missed a chance of the primary period because there are periods that you need to be in the primary for. If you miss that period, then there's a slating period where you can, again, get your petitions out, gather the signatures, hopefully you won't get objected, so you can be on the ballot in the general election without going through the primary process. That's what slating is. So to your question, it's, it's about the primary. It's about the two-party system just taking control over the statutes currently when it comes to even getting that ballot. Jason, you have a question. Um, the pro-polls primary, yeah. did you call um, your um, ballot as like a different thing than the other ballot? Like, you still go vote for the ballot and then you still have to go vote for the other ballot? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again. Like, the primary. Like, like, in the general election? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, for the primary election, if I was a Democratic person, I said I want the Democratic ballot. Then I can say I want this person, this person, this person. When it comes to the general election, then you can vote for whoever you want. It's just the primary itself. You choose Republican or Democrat. Now, with that being said, the Democrats and Republicans have that information now to give to that candidate and saying these are the people who vote Democrat. These are the people who vote Republican. Go get them. So it's a ver also a very effective strategy tool when it comes to campaigning because when I campaign with the Greens, I took all that list and said, okay, here's the people in your district. Here's the people in your district. Go get them. See why they vote Green, and hopefully we can get more candidates elected. So for one, it's a strategy tool. And secondly, it's just trying to channel people into one party to another party when it comes to that primary, just for the closed. We're talking opens a whole different other beast we're content with. Yes, sir. After it does the uh, primary, when people take make that choice, is it predicting what's going to happen in general? No, it, no, because that now we're talking about change. Yeah, okay. so I'm getting that because you know some people are only going to be short for the primary. Right. So just go and get to job. And that's the thing. I mean, I've oh. had two parents who vote every general election year. They never vote in the primary. And I ask, why don't you vote in the primary? He goes, because I don't want to be, you know, tagged as this person or that person. I want my own independent vote in the general election. So you're right. People in Illinois skip the primary altogether and go right to the general election. And no, the numbers don't mean if this many people voted Democrat, then this Democrat candidate's going to win. No. Because it went from the general election. I mean, now we're talking... See, the primary was in February in 08, but the general election was in November. So you have that period right there that the Obama campaign could have went down or went up depending on whatever. So now we're talking about a whole campaign strategy at that point. So to answer your question, no, it has no bearing of the general election outcome. Yes? Um, in Illinois, the laws pertaining to voting, mm -hmm. are those directly written or altered through the legislature or is there like a uh, election commission board of some sort or how does that work? I like that question because <laughs> the state board of election is appointed by the general assembly. They're all employed by the state of Illinois. We have a committee that oversees the Illinois state board of elections. So all the people on Spring Street in that office are employed by the state, like I said. And then there's a whole committee on elections themselves that oversee all the statutes I just pointed out to you on the general election website. Those are all legislative statutes, which then the State Board of Election has to act out. So when anyone goes to the State Board of Elections with a complaint, they're complaining to them but the same token, they're also complaining to that legislator saying, well, you need to talk to this person because he's the one who drafted that bill. So it's like a two-step process all by itself when it comes to that, which makes it very bureaucratic and very hard when it comes to actual reform. Mary. So before 2010 when Rich ran again, yes. I could have voted straight Green Party ticket yes. primary. Correct. And then, um, so now, 
somebody's got to run again and get over what percent? Five percent or greater. Five percent. And they have to run for a specific hierarchy type. They just can't run for city council. Or no. And I'm going to answer that in two and a half parts. <laughs> The first part is, in Illinois, it has to be the, gu the gubernatorial candidate, that governor's candidate. So Scott Lee Cohen could have gotten 5% or greater and could have been, had an established party status for independence party, if he had the independent party, but he was an independent candidate. Um, so that could have been bad <laughs> on so many levels. Um, but yeah, it has to be the gubernatorial candidate. Why the gubernatorial candidate? I don't know. I haven't researched further on why that particular race. In Wisconsin, you need to achieve 1% or greater to achieve ballot access, and it could be anyone from gubernatorial candidate to the treasurer. So each state is different when it comes to getting on the ballot. Wisconsin is probably the most easily state to get on the to get ballot access versus Illinois is bad. North North Carolina is bad because you need like 200,000 signatures just to get on the ballot for, for any particular candidate. Iowa, you need it. You need 5,000 signatures just to be on the ballot over there with no um, gubernatorial and all that. So to answer your question about city council and everything, that's the case we're fighting now with State Board of Elections with the Green Party is that we have certain areas that we have an established party status. The Metro Water Reclamation District in Chicago, which covers the city of Chicago, all of the Green Party candidates got 7%. So we have established party status in that one district. But the State Board of Elections says, no, you don't. You lost everything. So we're trying to understand this gray area. What, what does it mean? 5%. Is it very specific or is it a greater thing? And if you read any of those statutes, it's very vague. You know, you have to read, I had to read it like 10 different times in order to understand certain things. It's like, this is crazy. You know, and I'm not, I mean, go on there on yourself if you have free time and read certain, some of those things because they are very legalese. Even like the most versed attorney will not even understand it with election law. It's because election law is somewhat new, but it's also very cryptid because there's legislative statutes as well as legally statutes. So hopefully that answers your so question. Is there any urgency to try to get somebody? Is there urgency? To try to get somebody, trying to get that 5%? There is. Um, libertarians are trying. As you know, Greens are trying. Constitutions are trying. Um, socialists, not so much. <laughs> um, so there is some urgency, but at the same token, we're trying to more focus on the reform aspect of it, not only the standards requirements, but try to be a little bit more lenient on, you know, established party status because, as some of you know, or if not most of you know, we want to have like multiple party lines because if you go to Europe, it doesn't matter if you're a conservative party, socialist, democrat, socialist. Green Party, Congressional Peace Party, you're on the ballot, no matter what, and you can choose anyone you want to. Here in the United States and Illinois, you only have two choices. And I'm sorry if I'm bashing the two-party two system, but I have that right because I worked with Democrats, so I'm going to poo on them for a minute. So, <clears throat> you have a question in the back? No, I'm just, I'm just uh, not crazy about the federal ballot, so you have to get the required amount of money. No, 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 okay. Okay, so like, let's say you're going to run for city council. Or let's say, let's, even let's go back, let's use the state rep district example. For run for state rep, you need at least, if you're an established party, 500 to 1,500 signatures in your state rep district. When I'm talking about states, I'm talking about actually getting ballot access in that state. So like in North Carolina, like I said, you need at least 200,000 signatures just to have ballot access in that state alone. So those are the, the two different things when it comes to petitioning to get ballot access 
and petition to get on the ballot. Does that answer your question? And the other thing you have to understand is if you're getting 200,000, those are 200,000 good yes. signatures. That, because okay. if you go in with 200,000, you don't have 200,000. They'll mail you. They'll, they'll work real hard to get 50,000. They'll work hard enough to get 10,000 off, whatever it takes so that you don't get on. Oh, yeah, and, and I'll get to you in a minute, Lou. Um, because even congressional race for right here, new party independent party for a U.S. House, you need at least 5,000 signatures. You need really 10,000 signatures mm -hmm. just to get on the ballot. Okay? And that's what Jim is saying that if you only get 5,000 and they check off every single signature off, you went from five to three. You're off the ballot. <coughs> you need assurance that you need 10,000 signatures, so if you went from 10 to seven, then you're still fair. So from a campaign management perspective, you need to worry about the at least part when it says that on the paperwork. And again, I mean, I've seen some atrocious attorneys where they'll say, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. And, you, and the petition signatures just dwindle down really fast. I mean, it's just really crazy. Yeah. Um, I know on a national level, yeah. once reached a certain point, mm -hmm. candidates can accept campaign financing yes. through the government. Mm -hmm. Is there something like that in Illinois? No. Nothing? We don't have that. It's just at a national level, at the presidential level. We don't have that for Anything. gubernatorial. I mean, and even at that level, um, you need 5% or better, or excuse me, 7% or better at the national level. I mean, that was the big thing in 2000 when we were trying to get Nader up to, you know, 7%, 7%, because we didn't care if you got, if you won. We won the, <laughs> we won the money. Right. The platform, yeah. Right. The platform, the right. voice. So, yes, sir, in the back. To uh, contest a signature, do they have to call up on and run a book for the person that they have to contest on these uh, signature ballots? Say that one more time. If they're contesting a signature mm -hmm. on one of the ones that's uh, 5,000 or 600, do they have to call up with one investigation of the uh, mm -hmm. person from the signature and all that? Yes. And you can go about a few ways. The two most popular ways is if I had the petition in front of me and say I don't like that one, don't like that one, then if the attorney agrees to that, then that goes back to the State Board of Elections saying these are the ones I'm objecting to following this Illinois statute and everything. And then the clerk at the State Board of Elections will say, okay, you're in that right. And then they will let that candidate know, I'm like, your signature being contested, what say you? Um, I can think of a case back in 2010. It was a guy in Evanston. He was a little bit crazy. He was a neo-Nazi. He went to every single door. He was running for governor. He was running for Congress. He was running for a Congress seat. He was running for state rep. He was also running for something else. Every for the gubernatorial petition, he wrote in the person's name and their address. Not their own signature, but his signature on where they lived. And it happened to be his relatives. And he only had 10 signatures for the gubernatorial race. Well, you need a lot more than just 10 signatures. His is thrown out automatically. Run for state rep. He met the requirements, but again, he forged other people's names. So he actually was fined for actually impersonating somebody. So there's even actual legal implications, like if you were actually, if I was going to sign Lou's name for running for city alderman, if I just say, okay, I know Chris, I'll just put his name down in his address. You know, I'm, you know, I can get in big trouble for that. So there's even further illegal implications after that. Did I answer your question? Anything else? Yes. I wonder, this is just my own curiosity. Yeah. The way I understand it, in Illinois at least, uh, governors have what they call their war chest, mm -hmm. which is campaign funds that are not spent 
-hmm. once they go out of office, they just get that money that's there free and clear. Right. Is that a typical thing as far as other For higher things? races, yeah. It, it, for gubernatorial races, for presidential races, congressional races, even mayor of Chicago, um, it depends on the race. Um, if you're Rahm Emanuel, you have a war chest to run for mayor of Chicago. Um, I don't know if Mayor Houston has a war chest. I highly oh, yeah. doubt it. Does he? Oh, yeah. He's good. So, I mean, it depends on the person, depends on the race. I mean, if we're talking, again, Chicago and Springfield, you might. If you're talking about Dixon, Illinois, no. But, again, it depends on the race and if you have that war chest and everything. But, yeah, I mean, I guess that's depending on that race. Are, are there restrictions on how that can be used? Not to my knowledge. I believe those. I believe those are unlimited, depending again, depending on if they meet campaign finance regulations. I think they changed. They made some changes in the last year or two about what they can do with the money uh, after they leave office. Um, and up to a certain year, you can take that money yourself. You had to pay taxes right. on it. But At I think some point. now it has to be. Go to a nonprofit or, or to another political organization. I don't think you can take, walk away from all of them anymore. And that's only if you're elected and then get out of office. Yeah. And you can't run for the office and then consider that your parole. No. no. Retirement plan? No. 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 And it, depending on the race, I mean, like Jim said, it can be dumped into a political action committee. So that's why you see all these people like regurgitate all their money because if you're like Obama, he can put that money into the Democratic Caucus Fund, he can put it somewhere else. It depends on how he wants to do it. But but Jim's right, I mean there is a up to a point you have to spend it somehow. And there's uh, there's more restrictions on federal offices than there is on state offices. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Chris. So in your opinion as Citizen, mm -hmm. how do we best directly go at uh, changing election law to be more fair? I, I feel. Do we petition the legislature? Do we petition the election I, board? There's a, a, a couple of ways to do it. I, I personally like referendums. Put it to question on a vote in the city of Springfield for an upcoming election and have the city of Springfield, the citizens of Springfield say, you know, do you think election law reform should be changed? Yes or no. And if you have an overwhelmingly amount of people in the state saying yes, then there ought to be some change. Now, what can happen after referendum? Well, hopefully the elected officials can see that and then they can say, well, my constituent said it needs to be changed. Well, what can we do? And then we'll figure out something from there. So that's one way. Another way is to Find out what bills are there, because there's always election law reform bills. Go there and testify before the House and State Senate Committee, and you can do it that way, saying why you feel this should be changed. I mean, the one I did in 09 was about the signature requirements alone, because they want to go from 10,000, excuse me, 5,000 to 10,000 for independent and new party people. For them in during the primary period of January and February. Senator Meeks, who was an independent of the South Side Chicago, turned Democrat, was one of the co-sponsor of that bill. And the one thing that I said to him was, Senator Meeks, you were an independent. You had to gather the 5,000 signatures to be in your seat as a senator. Why do you want to go from 5,000 to 10,000 while you full well know what, how hard it is to get that amount of signatures in Illinois cold. Why do you want to put someone else through that same process of going 10,000 signatures while now they need 20,000 signatures? It doesn't make sense. And luckily, you know, that particular bill was thrown out of, out of committee. So I didn't ever saw the light of day, thank God. So, um, so those are the two ways. I feel referendum or just pressuring people in the Capitol. Those are my two ways of going about doing it. Can you go back to open primary and talk a little bit about what you see as the benefit to that type of system? Why open primary is a benefit? 
Well, first start with the definition, and then why do you think of that? Well, I don't know if I hand it up here or not, but an open primary um, is where a registered voter can choose any party regardless of their affiliation. So if you were a Republican, and the state of Illinois had an open primary process, then as a Republican, if you feel that this Democratic person is someone you feel is good, then you can go and vote for that particular person. But you can't vote for both. You no. You can pick one or the other. You can pick one or the other. So it's, that's what I mean by open. Closed is, like I said, you have two options, red or blue. And then open primary, you can choose either red or blue. Because, <laughs> like I said, if you're a Democrat, I mean, you can pick and choose. You can pick and choose a candidate. Yeah, but I can that change each, each time. What's that? I mean, if, I, if I'm a registered Democrat and I vote in the primary, mm -hmm. the next primary I can vote as a Republican. Right. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a perfect thing. This is like some of the options that are happening in other states. But I'm just trying to understand what's the difference. The, the, big, the biggest thing is. When you go into an open primary, you do not have to declare a Republican right. or a Democrat ballot. And a lot of people don't want to go into a primary and say, you know, I'm, I'm on a Democrat ballot or I want a Republican ballot. And it used to be in Sangamon County, the majority of people went in and pulled a Republican ballot because the Republicans controlled the jobs. Before you had unions in, in state government, the Republicans controlled the jobs. So you, you went in, if you wanted a state job, you pulled a Republican ballot. And they, I've got a list in my, in my car of all the Democrats in my precinct. I can go to the county board or county election office and I get a list of everybody vote Democrat or everybody vote Republican in any precinct. And so the Republican Party, when, you're, when you had an application for a state job, that, that application actually went over to county headquarters. Republican County headquarters, and they look to see if you were Republican. They look at your family members, see if they were Republican, and then they they take a look, you know, and you had your letter from your precinct committee, man, and then they, you know, depending on how your family voted and how you voted over the years. So, so in open primary, they, you can't use that. No, each party doesn't get a list. Well, so yeah, nobody knows. Right. Nobody, nobody knows. knows. Yeah, because you don't declare. And yeah. with the open primary, the ballot has both Democrats and Republicans on it. I think in a, lot of, in, in a lot of open primaries, you can go in. You're either going to vote a Democrat ballot or a Republican ballot. You can't. You can't be. It's not like a general election where you switch back right. and forth. You either go, you go in, like if I was going in, I'd vote a Democrat ballot, or I'd go in, I'd vote a Republican ballot. But nobody would know that. Right. Nobody so would. I'm kind of getting like her. I don't understand how it's open if you're limited to only choosing one part. Well, and it depends. There's, there's other more open ones where you can switch back and forth. Right. But, but the, big, <coughs> the big reason that most people would tell you they don't vote in the primary in Illinois is they don't want to declare their party. Because you're that's, that, that's beside the issue. We're just trying to understand what is open primary. Okay. Because I thought it, you had both, you had everyone who's running in the primary on a ballot if it's open ballot. No, it's, you're it's, saying it's not like that. No, it's like what Jim said. Like if you were a Republican and you want to vote Democrat, you can do that, but no one will have it. But no I have one. to vote all Democrats. Right, but the, but no one one party. Right, but no one on but you, there'll be no record to say that you did that versus now. But you're still limited to right. one party. Right. Because it's even though it's open, you're still limited to one party. Right. Well, I'm just understand something too, and that is uh, on the uh, open one. Is it just on one sheet? It's on one sheet. Okay. I mean, you would just get. I, mean, that's what I, a lot, I wish I had brought it with me. I, I've never wrote it in an open uh, primary before. Right. But I'm just saying, if you won't have it in on no. one sheet, nobody really knows which way it's going. I should, have brought, I should have brought some sample ballots in. I mean, it's just it's like one piece of paper, or yeah. depending on how, many, how long the list is. Yeah, because, I mean, because in the primary, it's two different ones. Or depending on who Right. Ones, right. I mean, whether it be closed or, whether it be closed or open, it's just mm -hmm. one ballot or the other. Right. Okay, so but like in the closed, in the closed, closed primary, everybody knows. So. Right, and that's the thing. That's like, that's the key. That's you know, so if it's closed, thing. you pick your party that you're choosing to affiliate with. Versus open, 
you don't, there would be no record of that. So like I said before, we have a closed primary. It's on record that you voted Democrat or Republican in the primary, which opens you up to get those phone calls that we all love during election year, <laughs> as well as it helps the candidate out saying, oh, this many people in that precinct voted. So like Jim said, he can go down to the county clerk's office saying, I want people in this precinct if they vote Democrat. And then he'll know what to do with that information, depending on what the purpose is for. <coughs> it's actually when you go to the county clerk's office, you say, I want the voting record for precinct Woodside 8, for example. Right. And they're going to give you, and I can look down that list and see how many people, I can look for several years, see who voted in the primary, if they voted Republican or Democrat. And so if I'm running uh, as a Republican or Democrat, either one, I'm going to go out. And the smart thing for me to do is get my hard R's or my hard D's, what they call that in the mm -hmm. campaign. I want to be sure that all those people that are that show that they typically vote Democrat, I want to be sure that those people get to the polls. I want to make sure I get my votes out, whether they're hard R's or hard D's, whatever, whatever you're running. And, and, all, and all that is public record. Yeah. You can go down to the county office and say and who voted, and it's also on record if they voted in past primaries. They won't show on record if you vote in the general election, because that's private, but it will show that you voted in the last primaries and what you voted as, as a track record. And some candidates even look at that. If it's a Democrat, 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 Republican, why? And then they'll probably go to that person saying, well, we saw the last primary, you voted Republican, but the last four years you voted Democrat, why? So that's the one thing about being on record is that's why people don't vote in the primary is they don't want to be on record. And I, you know, I congratulate them because, you know, I vote in the primaries because I don't care, but I won't now because my party's gone. So, I mean, um, if you want to be on record, that's up to your um, personal. Are you familiar with Alderman Cannon and where we signed the U.S. Board of Guards today? Say that one more time. Alderman Cannon. No. Sam Can Man. What's, what's Can Man, every time Can Man runs, he goes out and he uses a wedge issue of doing away with the open primary. And that's his big thing when he's running. He says, I'm going to get rid of the open primary, I'm going to get rid of the open primary. Uh, when he ran against uh, Ray Poe uh, several years ago, Ray said, hey, I don't have a problem, let's get rid of it. Uh, because Sam uses it as a wedge issue. That's, that's what he's using. He's, he's out there trying to get people to vote for him because they think he's going to be able to change it. Chances of changing that now in the way are slim to none. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to get an idea specifically what he was doing. Yeah. Had to do with the primary. Yeah, that's what it is. He's trying to get it to an open primary. Uh, but getting the rest of the legislature to, the way to get an open primary in Illinois is, is, is his idea of a, is a, you know, a statewide referendum. That's a, that's the only time that they're going to feel really a pressure, right. because otherwise, if you've got there are there are other state legislators over there who support an open primary, but not enough that you'll ever have a majority to get it through. But a statewide referendum that's not open to the general public to bring that up, is it? There's a way. I don't know how you do a statewide. In order to there is a way because if you look. I don't know if it has to be a constitutional amendment or what. No, was it a constitutional amendment when we went from a three, three in the legislature down to one district? No. I don't remember. State constitutional amendment. Huh? State constitutional amendment. Yeah. See, years ago, in the Illinois legislature, you had three state reps in every district. And then when Pat Quinn ran, or Pat Quinn worked real hard to get it, get it thing run through to change it so you only had one state senate or state rep for each district. And that they got that passed. That's when your legislature went down from a whole big bunch of people to a much smaller legislature like you have now. And can be very well argued that by condensing it or coming getting a smaller legislature that you actually have less representation because it has become more of a, uh, of a professional kind of job than it used to be. Is it, I can remember, you know, in, in most districts, what you had was you had 
two Republicans and a Democrat, or two Democrats and a Republican. So almost everybody's view was expressed because if you were the majority, let's say you're in a, in a district that has a majority of Republicans, well, you usually elected two Republican state reps. But you still, the other people had that Democrat rep to represent them, the smaller percentage, vice versa. Because Murray, well, in Chicago, I'm sure there were some districts where it was all Democrats, and some downstate probably, you know, there were a few that were all Republicans. But the majority of districts, you had two from one party and one from another party. So even though your party might not have won, the party you identified with might not have won both seats, you probably still had one in there that you could go to and, and talk to that would vote. As it is now, the only way to get a referendum on the ballot is the current city legislature has to pass that referendum to get it on the ballot. Well, like, like I don't know what it is. No, I mean, like, like it, it dep you can do it two different things. When I back home in my hometown, Strowan, Illinois, one of the things that we did as a referendum was put to the question for the residents of Whiteside County if if you feel the troops should come back home from the Iraq war. So what we had to do, there's an actual petitioning period for put a referendum to question where you need signature requirements for that. And then that was only at the county level. So once we got that passed, everyone in the county on the ballot saw that one question. For statewide, and you, again, you can either go to the candidates guide or go to the State Board of Elections website, which is um, S, oh, excuse me, ISBE um, .org. And there should be a, a link on there for referendums for putting the statewide. <coughs> they tell you the criteria in order for it to happen and everything, but again, it has to be a collective effort in order to get a statewide thing. So you can't just do it in Springfield. You have to go out throughout the whole state in order to get it on the ballot. And then um, Springfield will look at that saying, okay, it can be on the ballot for, at the general election. And, and those referendums are non binding. Right. That's but if you if you got a big enough vote, then the people, you know, the, you can get the legislature to say, eh, maybe we better do something about this because there's like a whole lot of people out there that want it. Right. But you, but you also know that that if it's a referendum that, that they don't want, they're going to spend money to defeat the referendum. Right. And you asked a question earlier, like Scott Lee Cohen, how he was gubernatorial candidate and now he was lieutenant governor candidate. That was a slating process when Mike Madigan kicked him out as a gubernatorial candidate. In the primary. In the primary. Then, in the general then he had to go through a slating period to collect all the signatures during January and February. And that's when he saw the comical dolly of signatures that he's rolled right in, which was political theater at its finest. Just roll it right in. Um, that's what he had to do. It was the same process of slating, trying to get his name on the ballot as a um, lieutenant governor, or as he, well, well, he was lieutenant governor to a gubernatorial candidate. We ran as an independent at that time. Yeah, you focus on some uh, elections, some of the discussions. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out a little bit more detail other than what I know of what might happen with the um, lieutenant governor part, okay. where. We had, a, we had the governor who was in there, but, mm -hmm. you know, like, but then those who were running the lieutenant governor who were, all, who, uh, were all on the ballot mm -hmm. who got their votes, and then, as I said, um, Sheila, I believe, was appointed on the ballot, which knocked everybody else out of right. the way. And I'm like, <laughs> somebody is going to be fighting my process. So unlike the presidency, the presidential candidate can ask someone to be their vice president candidate to be on the ballot, okay? We don't have that in Illinois. You have to run a separate governor's race and a separate lieutenant governor's race. Okay. So when Pat Quinn was getting reelected as governor, Scott Lee Cohen came to the picture as his <coughs> potential lieutenant governor. Mike Madigan didn't want to do anything with that because <laughs> he wants someone else in there which was Sheila, Sheila Simon, which was a smart move on their part, in my opinion. Um, so the, uh, we have a board candidate 
There were four candidates. Um, Scott Lee Cohen was one of them. Um, I forgot who the other three people were. They spent money, they got on the ballot, went through the whole process, right. to become lieutenant governor. Right, but then right. Mike yeah. Madigan got involved <laughs> right. and said, no, Scott, leave. Scott left, but then again, like I said, when, he, when Scott got to be on the gubernatorial ballot, he went through a slating process because he was always, he was already in the, the primary process, but only for lieutenant governor. So he had to slate himself as an independent to be in the gubernatorial race. So he had to collect more signatures than he was as an established party candidate when he, that he was as a Democrat. So he had to go through the process again but a higher signature requirement for governor. Yeah, <laughs> that's the, and that's that's the same thing we get too when we have to go through the Illinois election process. So, like I said, you have to run separate campaign, well, se separate races, governor, lieutenant governor, and then you have to get the necessary requirements for signatures, and then go through the process and everything. And it is my, I mean. Even to this day, I can't get my mind wrapped around Illinois law because it's so atrocious for that very reason. I didn't vote for Scott, but I felt sorry for him. They had to go through the whole process again, you know. But it was, again, comical when he came down here with all those dollies and just with all those signatures. like, really? <laughs> then he went out and hired people to get his signatures. Right. Any other questions? I know this is so thrilling. <laughs> if nothing else, I'm, I'm doing my presentation. I'm maybe more happy to answer your questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So thank you for coming on this Monday evening. I know it's probably hard for most of you, but I'll thank you for coming out. And is it still raining out there? Yeah. I even thank you for that. <coughs> so again, thank you.